Hello, everybody, and welcome to TechLore. Today, we have Kerry on for the podcast, and he manages a podcast, and he wrote a book called Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons, and his work is phenomenal, and today, we're gonna talk about privacy and security, his approach to privacy and security, and how it might differ from ours, but in lots of good ways, and I think that all of you should explore other people in this space, and I think Kerry's a perfect person to introduce you all to that. So welcome, Kerry, to TechLore. Thanks, man. And yeah, I 100% agree. And I and I really like that you take that position. And like you and I are not in competition. I mean, you, our point is to reach people and teach people stuff. So it's good that they get it from multiple sources. Absolutely perfect that they get it from multiple sources. I, and like you, I highly recommend that people do that. Why don't we just start with some of the things that you do? So. The first place that I discovered you actually was I was looking for podcasts. I found it, but it's weird because I didn't hear about it before. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's interviewed some pretty massive names. Like you just recently did Andy Yen, uh, who is the CEO of Proton. And you've actually interviewed him in the past as well. And you have a ton of other big people on your podcast. So what's the goal of bringing these people in front of your audience and how has it been interacting with them? Me personally, I like talking to these guys. I mean, I love, I mean, I'm learning, right? When I'm interviewing these guys, I'm asking them questions I want to know and you know, I'm on behalf of my audience, but you know, I love to learn from uh, this stuff too. And so for me, I, I really just get off on being able to pick these guys' brains. And, and then I want to, my, I want to be a conduit, you know, for that stuff to uh, my audience. So these guys have obviously got a lot of great experience. I try not to call myself a privacy expert because to me, these guys are the experts, right? So you know, I, I'm an advocate, I'm an evangelist, you know, I know people that, you know, know way more than I do. So it's, you know, I, I feel weird calling myself, you know, an expert. So to me, I want to channel the experts. I want to bring these guys on and, and have them explain to my audience. And I, and I prep them. I said, you know, some of these guys are uber technical and I say, you know, my audience isn't necessarily technical. I'm sure I've got, you know, technical folks listening, but I want to make sure that I don't lose anybody. Cause to me, I want to hit as many people as possible. And that's, you know, if you rule out non-technical, then now you're looking at 99% of the population. I want to hit those people. Right. So, yeah. So for me, it's, it's about, bringing the two audiences together and tapping their brains and then channeling that to my audience so they can learn too. I really like that approach. And I really like your take on the term expert, which I feel is kind of a lost term on the internet nowadays. You started with the book. So you sent me a copy of your book. I read it in a few days. It was fantastic. I think that the target audience for the book is people who have never touched privacy and security before. And they're like, what the hell do I do? I think it was a great introduction to privacy and security and what inspired you to make it? What's the origin story? And how did that book eventually lead to your podcast? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it is a bit of a story. So where it really hit me, what, what prompted me to write the book? I mean, I've always kind of wanted to write a book. I'm, I'm a person who likes to write anyway. I've been journaling ever since I was, gosh, since I was a kid. And I've just, for an engineer, I'm kind of weird as an engineer. Most engineers don't like that. I was actually in a position at a, at a job once where we were starting to do layoffs. And one of the reasons they didn't lay me off when they just had to cut headcount was because I was so good at writing documents. I actually took over our document writing as well as doing my engineering duties and that saved my job. Anyway, so I've always wanted to write a book. It's been kind of a bucket list thing. And then the Snowden stuff dropped, right? Snowden dropped the bombshell of what was going on. All the things that we kind of thought might be happening. I was like, yeah, they're happening. And it's worse than you thought. To me, I was thinking, okay, I want to do something about that. And so that led to the book. I, I've always wanted to write a book. And I went looking. I mean, there's a For Dummies book on everything, right? And you can find a For Dummies book on any topic you want. And there are people copied that format. I went looking in 2000, when was it? 13 for like a cybersecurity for dummies and it existed, but it was like six years old. And it was like that in that, in this realm, that's forever. Right. So I'm like, okay, let's do that. I, Cause I'm, people ask me that anyway, I'm the IT guy for the family. They're always asking me, you know, Carrie, you know, do I have a virus carry? Should I be, you know, using a VPN? You know, and they're asking me all these questions anyway. Well, why don't I just write it all down? And then I could just say here, read this. And so that was the book. And so I self-published my first book and have since been picked up by a publisher. It's in the fourth edition now. But then as I was doing that, somebody invited me on their podcast. Somebody found me and he invited me on his show. And then he invited me back again because he liked what, what was there. And then he said, I'm out. I'm, I'm quitting the business. But the way he was on this network, this podcasting network, and he had to find a replacement for himself. Like when you're on this network, you pay them to be on their network and do the podcast. A lot of money, by the way. And, uh, and he was like, you know, do you want to take over? And I'm like, okay, why not? I'll give it a shot. And, uh, and so I paid to be on this network, which kind of brought me some audience for that and started the podcast. And that, that was five years ago. So yeah, that's the story of how I went from the book to the podcast. So one thing you talked about was the six years is, you know, ages in this space. 
and you mentioned you're on your fourth edition. So what are some of the reasons for that? What are the issues that you've dealt with? And is it difficult to stay up to date with all these things? It is really difficult. So um, a book is, you know, once you print it, it's done. You can't change it. Unlike a web page, right? Or, you know, a video you can reshoot or whatever. Uh, and I'll, I've noticed some of the videos I've watched in yours too, which is clever, you know, where you go back at some of the videos and like, there's one key fact that changed and you put a little banner or whatever. It's like, this has changed, you know, this is no longer here. Try this or whatever, which is great, which allows you to kind of update things right without redoing everything. And, and but we, we actually complain that we have to make a whole new video and we wish that we were a website <laughs> and you're on a whole nother level of needing to rewrite a whole book. <laughs> right. Right. So it, it does irk me because I want it to be as up to date as possible. So I try to. Obviously, when I publish, I try to make it as accurate as I can when it's published. But I've been updating about every two years. And in two years, even in two years, a lot of stuff will change. And so there's two things. First of all, I update the book. So every couple of years, I put on another edition where I go through the trouble. A lot of it's screenshots. My book has got a lot of step-by-step -step stuff with screenshots. And, you know, what Firefox and what Mac OS and Windows and all those things look like changes a lot, even in two years. They move stuff. They, they change what they call something. And so... You know, a lot of the work actually is going back, running various VMs and doing screenshots of all that stuff all over again to make it up to date. But then I also publish errata. So I've actually got a, uh, my publisher has a nice little, it's a GitHub site for my book where I can actually go through. And, and so as something gets really out of date or if the product goes away or changes significantly, that's kind of my web page for the book. So you could go there and, and get uh, the book errata. I also, because it's a paperback book and not everybody has a, a PDF, um, there's a lot of links in my book. And so I actually go through, I've got a script actually that I wrote that does this, combs through the PDF, pulls out all the links, puts them in chapter order, and then I keep that on a website as well. So if those change, I can at least update those. And if someone has a physical book, they can go to the book link webpage and still have something they can click on. So yeah, it's a pain. <laughs> it's a process, but yeah. Now in the book, one of my favorite things that I read that I think is, is very important that people should listen to, and I really want you to expand on this, I've never considered before, um, because for me, when you take control of your own privacy and security via several steps, whatever those steps are to the individual, it feels like a very personal process. You know, I am improving my privacy by taking X, Y, Z steps to improve my own personal privacy. But a concept that you cover in your book is that improving your own privacy indirectly improves the privacy of everyone. So do you mind expanding on this and more of the we effort involved? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so privacy is definitely first, it's first and foremost, obviously it's a me thing it, as the, as privacy kind of implies, it's, it's your information. It's your ability uh, to tell your tale the way, the way you want to tell it, to, to share with other people. And, you know, you might share different things with different people, uh, in your life, what you want to share and how you want to share it and, and when you want to share it. So I think that's obviously the first step in privacy, but what I've definitely come to learn and what even I guess from the Snowden days where it really kind of hit me, I've always been a personally private kind of a person. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm open with my friends and family, but, um, you know, when I go on the web, like on Facebook, I was always a lurker, even in the old days of Facebook, I didn't post a lot. I just kind of watched other people. Cause I've just, I don't like to share a lot of that stuff publicly. Um, but what I've learned over the years as, as I've gotten into this is that really it's much bigger than that. The first step is you. And then the next step is it's a we thing on a basic level. Think about like your contact list. If I share my contact list, like it was a big thing when you'd sign up for Yahoo, they'd say, well, give us your access to your Google account. And that way we'll automatically find all the people, you know, and we'll just bring them in. That's so convenient for you. Let us do that for you. All right. A lot of them want to access to your contact book or contact uh, in your address book because there's a lot of information there. So when I do that, I am now sharing information about everybody I know potentially without asking them first. So that's one way. DNA is another one. You take these DNA tests, you are literally sharing bits of yourself and other people, any blood relative, along with what you're sharing for yourself. If you're asking for your DNA information, every blood relative you have, certainly the near ones, you're sharing that information as well. And that has bit a lot of people in the butt. Those are just two examples, but I mean, your data, the, the, the sphere of your data overlaps the spheres of everyone in your immediate area as well. When you post pictures, do you only post pictures with your face in them? No, you probably post group pictures, party pictures, and then the people tag people in those pictures that aren't you, right? I mean, so it's, from that perspective, you got to realize the bare minimum that when you're sharing information about yourself, it's very, very hard to only share information that is just about you. But then more to your point, um, this was with security as well. When I have better privacy, 
because uh, I, my privacy includes some of your privacy. When I have better privacy, it helps you too. Uh, same thing with security. When, when If I've got if I beef up my security to the point where I'm not doing dumb things and not getting infected, then that also means that the people near to me are probably not likely to get the virus either, right? So it's this herd immunity kind of a thing, and it applies to security as well as privacy, where we don't have to necessarily get everybody, but the more people we get, the better off everybody is, even if you're not participating. So I really like your approach to that. And it's, again, it's not something I've ever thought of before. So like genuine thank you for really bringing that perspective on it because it's not something I've considered before. And why don't we start pivot pivoting over to more of these privacy and security topics. So what are some of your favorite privacy tools that you use on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, and honestly, you cover a lot of these in like in the Go Go Incognito course and all the other stuff you do. So there there are some just quick top, you know, quick top fives that are easy, right? Make browser, change browser. For God's sakes, don't use Chrome. I just did a whole series on de-googling your life. So there's Google is so up in your life um, in so many ways. If you use an Android phone, obviously you're, you've got a Google operating system. And unless you take steps not to, which you guys explain how to do, but for the average person, who doesn't do that? It's Android is made by Google. I mean, their products are great. And I mean, I jumped in with both feet in 2004 when Gmail came along and, and the products, I mean, from a functionality standpoint, they're wonderful, but just over the years, as they realized they had access to all this data and they wanted to monetize it and we're in a capital society, I get it. I, I mean, that's money on the table, right? And their shareholders want that stock to go up and we've got no regulations to say they can't. So it, it's not at all surprising that these companies that have the information are monetizing that data. But over the years, I've, as they've done it more and I've gotten more concerned about privacy, I've just realized I've got to dial back to the best of my ability my Google life. And it goes hand in hand with some of these top, you know, these top tips. So, you know, you don't use Chrome browser if you can. Uh, there's many others. Brave and Firefox are probably the two big ones I'd recommend. Uh, Brave, if you just don't want to worry about setting anything, set and forget. Brave is a great first go. If you want to, if you have the patience to, you know, turn some knobs and, and dials and things and do some plugins, Firefox, I think is better, which I tend to use that. And then get away if you can from Google pro uh, products in general. So I, I've tried to move away from Gmail and Google Calendar where I can. There's a lot of other great services. Um, if you just want the functionality and know that the company is not really, you know, about monetizing your data, FastMail is, is a, almost a drop in replacement. They've got, you know, their, their mail and calendar are wonderful and they've got other stuff uh, as well. Uh, and they don't care about your data and you pay them money and so they don't have to. Uh, and then of course, Proton Mail and things like Proton Mail, Tutanota and some of these others that are very privacy focused. Uh, if you want to go uh, the full route, I actually use both uh, for different reasons. Uh, so, you know, email is another obvious one where you want to uh, do that. I am an Apple guy. I've been an Apple guy for a really long time before privacy was part of that. I just kind of always liked Apple products. But, you know, if you're just going to hit the easy button and you're not going to go too crazy, um, obviously, if you have an Android phone, you can put custom open source OSs on it and, and all that kind of stuff, which is great if you've got the patience and skill. Uh, but if you just want to hit the easy button, you know, go to Apple stuff. I mean, they're not perfect. <laughs> but and again, and I think this is coming back to something you preach a lot of time, too. It's not always about being perfect. You know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. There's, you know, when you're getting low hanging fruit, when you're doing the basic things, if you don't have a certain amount of time or don't have a certain amount of money, take these simple steps. Do the do the simple stuff first. It'll make a huge difference. And then later, if you want to take kick it up a notch and spend more money or spend more time, you can. But I mean, most people don't have time for that stuff. So a lot of what I recommend in the book, and you, you alluded to this earlier, it's really about the 90 percent. It's about. The, the people who have got better things to do with their lives, but I, I just want to check off the, the, as few boxes as I can with as little effort as I can and maybe a little money as I can. You should spend money where you need to, but if you don't have to, you don't have to, 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 to get these kind of uh, simple low-hanging fruit things that it such, makes such a huge difference. And that's where I'm, I'm, I'm a lot about that. that. That is where I focus a lot of stuff on that. Stop oversharing on social media. Uh, if you insist on using it, you know, try not to overshare. Be careful with your location data, you know, Go on your apps, go through your apps and make sure you'll dial down what permissions you give out, particularly things like access to your location information. And I, one thing I love about iOS is you can tell it, you know, I, I only want to give it the information when it's the forefront app and only then. That makes sense. If it's an Uber app, I, you know, when I'm actively using it, fine, Uber, you can know where I'm at. Otherwise, no, I don't want you to know where I'm at. Some of the private relay stuff they're doing is really interesting. That that came around recently where if you're, I hope they expand this beyond just Apple products, but it's kind of like a mini tour. It's like a a, a micro VPN or a micro tour. It's got two nodes instead of three like Tor does. It does enough encryption and an and onion routing ish sort of things that the one side doesn't know what the other side's doing. So, uh, and that's built into some of the Apple products now, which is great. And 
the reason location is involved in that is you can tell it, I want to give it my general location, like city level, because your IP address would normally give that away. And they, they could tell you, I want to give you coupons for where you're at locally. But if, if I'm doing this kind of hiding thing, they don't know where I'm at. They can't look at my IP address, my real one. But you can say, give it my general information and it will come up with a fake IP address that's local. Or you could tell it, I don't want to, I don't want to know where I'm at. And it'll pick any IP address on the planet. Um, so that, again, Apple's doing some great work there. Uh, they're not perfect, uh, but I think they're doing some great work. So by default, I mean, I just go Apple products, honestly. That's that's a little stream of consciousness, but that, <laughs> that's that's what comes to my mind when I think about those things and the first things I would tell people. Very cool. I really like what you said about shooting for the 90%, and I think it's a good reminder. And it's not. it doesn't mean that people, especially our audience, doesn't mean that you should just stop and just be happy with where you're at, but I, sh I think it should be a reminder that you're probably doing significantly better than a huge percentage of the population and to be happy with that um, and just acknowledge that you've done a great job, but there's probably more, we, it'd probably be better for the world if we invested our energy in getting everyone else to 90% than to getting you from 98 to 99%. Right, right, yeah. That's that's kind of, I think, Carrie's approach to this as well as ours, but not as extensively. I think you very much are better focused on that. Let's get the entire world to 90 percent, um, which is, I think, at the end of the day, much better for everyone. What do you normally recommend to people? I think you kind of alluded to this with your privacy tools, but where do you recommend people start? You know, someone you just meet someone, they're like, oh, wow, yeah, privacy is kind of a big deal. What do I do? What's kind of the first what are the first basic steps you, you send them off on? Well, again, I th I'll probably come back to the browser because I think it's the easiest thing to do because it's probably the easiest thing to replace. If you look at if you start looking at other Google products like Google Calendar in particular, and that's one I'm still struggling with because I was so deep into it. All my family uses Google Calendar, and we share calendars. So to get away from that, I have to move not just me, I have to move them. So the products where you have kind of complete control and it's like it doesn't extend beyond yourself, those are the easy ones to to tell people to change. So Chrome, you know, getting away from Chrome and getting onto Firefox or Brave is, is a pretty straightforward one. Um, some of the harder ones that, are, again, are it's not because, well, it's proprietary, so it does affect other people. It's like Signal, right? So if I move to Signal because it's proprietary, it's open source, but it's no one else uses it really. So if, if I want to talk to somebody, they have to be on Signal too. So some of those are kind of hard. If it affects more people beside yourself, VPNs are tricky because I, I, they don't do what a lot of people think they do. And they, they're sometimes painted as a panacea for privacy, which they are not. And so just the fact that it takes a lot to explain really what a VPN is doing for you, uh, it's not, it's not a quick sound bite. Um, and it's not, it's not the, again, it's not the silver bullet that a lot of people think it is. So I don't often do that, but for certain situations, if I understand what they're doing, uh, honestly, what I usually tell people to do what is like when they're using Wi-Fi, don't use public Wi-Fi, set up a hotspot on your phone. Yes, it all does go through your cellular provider, but at least it's kind of the devil, you know, uh, in a way. So like, I don't use public Wi-Fi anywhere. Uh, I, I just use my cellular hotspot. And if I wanted to, I could VPN through that if I really wanted to. Um, but, you know, just you don't need it. You're, if you, as long as your cell phone plan supports it, it's it's a lot easier than trusting the coffee shop and the airport and the hotel and the McDonald's, you know, and all these other people that they're not going to try to, you know, peek at your stuff or somebody sitting next to you in those venues is not going to try to poke at you too. All right. So the other thing, and this is, this is maybe more security than privacy, though you, it's hard to have privacy without security, right? So um, to me, the way I look at that is security enables privacy. They're not the same thing. Uh, they're somewhat two sides of the same coin, maybe. But uh, I think it more in terms of security enables privacy. The, another simple thing that people really need to do, because humans just are not built for remembering passwords that are good, right? I mean, we, we're pattern things. Our, our animal behavior, our brain works on patterns. And so if you've got a pattern in your password, you're already behind the eight ball. I mean, you're already screwed, right? If there's a pattern, that means it's guessable on some level. It makes it memorable, but you should not know any of your passwords except for your password manager's master password. And that should be like some passphrase. You can spend a lot of time and effort on some really great password for your password manager. And then everything else you shouldn't even know. It should be some gobbledygook that's 30 characters long that you'll never remember, which is fine. And no one can, and therefore nobody could guess, right? So uh, password managers are big and, and it's painful because you've usually got to migrate your passwords to it. Then you got to change all your passwords. It's not an easy one, but man, it's big. And then the next step is two-factor authentication. Um, and again, it's more security than privacy, but uh, if for some reason you screw up and you make a guessable password or LastPass or 1Password or Bitwarden somehow screws up and doesn't 
uh, you know, and, and that first, or, or, or someone bypasses authentication. You want that second level defense. You want the defense in depth, right? You want not just the castle wall, and go back to my analogy, not just the castle wall, but the inner keep wall or the castle guard, right? You want multiple things that someone has to defeat to get at the prize. And so uh, two-factor authentication is huge. And I always tell people to use the pin-based, the you know, TOTP, time-based, one-time password stuff, as opposed to SMS, because SMS, while way better than nothing, uh, if that's your only option, use it. But um, if you have a chance to use Authy or Google Authenticate, you know, Authy, if you have a chance to use uh, a TOTP uh, pin app, that's way better and way more secure than um, going with SMS. You're allowed anyway. to have your own opinions here if you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. shout out Authy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am curious, um, have you played around with hardware keys at all? I just picked up a YubiKey recently, and I'm curious if you've played around with them. I probably have five of them, like just to my left. Like <laughs> I've, I've over the years been trying to evaluate them. If you really want security, that is a great way to go. My issue is convenience. Like I, knowing that I have to have that with me everywhere, I have my, even if I'm naked, I've got my phone in my hand, but I don't have my car keys in my hand, right? If I don't, I don't carry around the physical key. So that is the, that is a problem for me. And if I, I guess I could, if I've got one of the micro things, I could leave it on my laptop sort of. And so it's always over with my laptop, but uh, I, I just can't get around the fact that I've always got to have this hardware key in my physical person. Again, when I'm looking at like my mom, there's no way in hell my mom is going to use a YubiKey. It's just, it, she just won't. If I won't, I know she won't. So I, I, while I do believe as far as a best practice, if that's, if, if you're really concerned and you want to be really secure, that is probably the way to go. That is probably your gold standard. But I, from the convenience factor, I find it hard to recommend for most people. I, I want to very much thank you for that because you mentioned you don't have your keys on you and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have two of them. I have the Nano and the bigger one and it has a loophole and I could put that on my keys. I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a lot easier. So thank you for that. I want to transition a little bit to yourself and your privacy journey and the reason for that for our audience is because everyone's privacy journey is their own personal journey. That's fun to share, but also you can probably learn a lot of things because Harry might be a lot further along on his journey than you. And even if he's not, he's probably going to talk about things that he's gone through that you can learn from. So it's very valuable information. So how did you discover privacy and what was your aha moment, if there was one? Yeah. So again, I've always been kind of a private person anyway. I've always been, I think in today we would call it, you have different avatars or you've got different personas uh, or different roles. They've, you know, the, the web has got different kind of meanings for these things. But there's, I'm, I'm a certain way with my friends. I'm a certain way with my family. I'm in a certain way with even a couple, with different groups of friends. I'm different at work. And I never thought about this consciously until I got into this space. It was just a, a natural thing for me is that I interact differently with those different audiences. And, and so that is an aspect of privacy. And then again, it was this, it was a Snowden thing. That was, that was certainly the spark for me for a lot of things. And I realized uh, that was the, my first inkling of realization, how important privacy was on a democratic and a societal and a human level. I mean, that's really where it got beyond personal for me and, and became, I, I realized how important it was to have privacy. And, you know, when I tell people, a lot of people equate privacy with secrecy and, and it's like, I've got something to hide. And it's, that's not about that at all. It's, it's, it's about what you, you being able to choose what you wish to share and you should have the right to do that when and where and how you, you want to do that. And so there's, we, there's reasons we have doors on bathrooms. There's reasons our walls at our house are not opaque or are not transparent. There's, you know, we've got shades on our windows. There's reasons we have bumper stickers like sing like no one is watching or listening, right? Or we sing in the shower. There's dance like no one's watching and, and, and we sing in the shower. So it, that's not because we're doing anything bad. It's it's because I don't want to share that right now. I, I have that for myself. And and so all these kind of things were things that I learned in my journey over the years. And, and I read a book called Privacy is Power. I know we're going to get this later, but it, uh, that book also really helped, ex uh, helped me understand how much overlap there is between my privacy and other people's privacy, even just at a personal level. And that, there's the societal stuff and de democratic society stuff that is important as well. But there's also that kind of middle layer of just your social graph and, and, and how your privacy impacts them. And so my journey is really over since I wrote the book. When I first started, I thought it was honestly much more about security. I didn't really even realize until two or three years later that, you know what? It's privacy. Privacy really is what I'm worried about here more than security. And one enables the other. So part of my journey was just understanding those were separate things and, and, and seeing that privacy is its own thing. 
there's a great TED talk from Glenn Greenwald that I watched at one at one point about privacy that opened up a lot of uh, thoughts for me personally about what it means to uh, to society, for, uh, why privacy is important and why it's important for democracy. And I can't explain it all here. I, I highly recommend you watch it. Just look up the TED talk from Glenn Greenwald on why privacy is important. And it opened that watching that opened a lot of uh, doors for me in terms of thinking about privacy. So. And then it's just gotten worse over the years too. So part of that privacy journey is just the fact that over the years, these data brokers have gone crazy and Google and Facebook and these guys have found more and more ways to monetize our data and want to hoover up even more and more data and found new and interesting and creepy ways to get that data. So it's gotten worse. So part of the privacy journey is reacting to all the ways in which things have gotten worse (laughs) over time because we don't have, we don't have regulations yet here in the United States. We've got, and, and, I know that people complain, you say regulation and like half the country, you know, just immediately throws up the head, like, I'm out, you know, regulation bad, you know, but there's a reason you can eat food and not test it yourself. There's a reason you take drugs from the drugstore and trust it. There's a reason that when you get in a car, you assume it's going to work and the brakes aren't going to fail. That's because we have safety regulations in this country and we have regulators and those regulators have a budget and, and they have you know, laws backing them up that if some company violates those things, they can go after them. That that's regulation. And and we just are missing that on privacy. Yeah. And we can also measure all the positive impacts <laughs> right. that things like GDPR and CCPA have done yeah. in the privacy world. So we're not saying I'm, I'm sure I'm not I don't want to speak for you here, but I don't think either of us are saying that it's the perfect solution and that all right. privacy problems will go away because of regulation. Oh, right. Oh, for sure. But like, it's just, we have nothing right now. Anyone can do whatever the hell they want with your data as long as they're not yep. on, in California or in the EU. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. It is a wild west. You're not, you're not the customer. You're the product. So do you have any regrets on your privacy journey? I try not to have regrets in general. Uh, you know, I kind of feel that life happens to you and you learn from everything. Uh, maybe the only real regret is I didn't kind of start sooner. Um, I'm really glad that I mean, the podcast kind of fell in my lap. I love doing the book. Um, I kind of wish I had started doing, even though I've been doing it for five years, I wish I had started doing some of the podcast sooner. I, cause I, I truly love doing the interviews and meeting these people and talking to people. So that's, that's one of the things I really enjoy doing. So maybe if I'd have done more of that or, or done more guests, um, but I've come a long way and I've done a lot of stuff and I'm really proud of the things I've done. I wish I could meet more or reach more people. That's really my struggle at this point is getting noticed and, and finding, you know, expanding my audience. The hard part is a lot of people don't even either. They don't know what they don't know. Like they don't understand how many ways they could be improving their privacy or they feel that it's a lost cause and they don't bother because they think that that's too late. You know, horses out of the barn. My data's already out there. I can't claw it back. Why try? Uh, and it's kind of this nihilism, this defeat in them. And I think for a lot of those reasons, they don't go see searching for this kind of stuff. And so how do you find those people? Right? So it's not really a regret, but certainly my biggest challenge, I think at this point is finding people and convincing them that they need to know these things and that it's not as hard as they think it is. There's the, that there's so many things that you can do that are really not that difficult, that really make a huge difference. And so that's, that's where I, that's my frustration, I guess, is, is that I feel that I can't get that message out more. One thing that we talked about when you had me on your podcast was the challenges in engaging with the more extreme side of the privacy community. Mm, mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned when we spoke that you disable all comments for your podcast. So do you mind expanding on this decision and why you made it? Yeah. So as you well know, uh, there are a lot of purists out there that I, nothing is, I'm sorry, nothing is perfect. I, I don't care what you're saying. So if, if you're saying that nothing is perfect, then there is no one product you can recommend. So therefore there's something bad to be said about everything, something, right? And unfortunately in, in our social media lives today, there's a lot of trolls and stuff. And I just, I just made the decision early on. I just, I wasn't going to deal with that. I, what I'd like to get feedback directly on, in, in, on my blog articles and say, Oh, that was great. I love this. Or, Hey, this is great. You might want to check this out too. I, I'm sad that I'm missing out on that, but I am not at all sad on the da- the flip side of that coin where this is dumb or, you know, this is so much better or that's a honeypot. These guys get caught doing this or, Oh, did you know they're paid off by so-and-so and they're totally corrupt and, you know, Oh, they were, you know, they failed, a. Uh, a privacy audit, you know, because they didn't do this one, they didn't check off one box. You can't use these guys. I, I don't want any of that. I just, you know, I just, I, I'm sorry. I just can't deal. My life's too short, you know, for my own mental sanity and my own emotional stability. I just, I just couldn't. So I didn't. 
And so uh, I, I turned off comments, unfortunately. It, I get comments other ways in ways that I can control more. Uh, I do a listener survey every year for my podcast where people can, that I know are already listening to my podcast and probably because they're listening to it are not going to be a troll. They're going to want to tell me things that will help me do a better job. You know, so in those, I do seek out feedback more directly in, in, in more scenarios where I can kind of control it. And I, I just kind of avoid the wide open, not, you know, I'm on Twitter, but even on the, the, the people I follow on Twitter don't tend to be jerks, I guess. Uh, I don't get a whole lot of flamey stuff on Twitter. And if I do, I just, honestly, I just ignore it. I just, I don't have time. That's a good approach. We opened the can of worms and I don't know if there's anything going back. Pandora, Pandora's box has been opened. I always wish we could turn off comments because they're just not easy to deal with. But on YouTube, especially now that dislikes are gone, you can't view dislikes. It's like the only version of feedback people can get on videos. And I think it's a big red flag if you enter a video and comments are disabled. So it's kind of hard on YouTube. But yeah, if it was just podcast only, I'd probably do the same thing, honestly. Um, yeah, that yeah, damn so social media, man. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah, I respect your decision of doing that. So we have about two questions left. And one of them is going to be a recommendation that you have for people in regards to their favorite books, your favorite books for them. And the second one is kind of just a broader privacy question. So the first one, what are some of your favorite books in the space that you recommend to people? So actually on my website, firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, I actually maintain a resources tab because I, I'm, I collect that stuff and I try to groom it and organize it. Groom's actually become a really bad word lately. I try... I, <laughs> try not to get political. That's actually another thing. That's another thing I do is I try to avoid politics because I don't want to alienate half my audience either. So I just don't go there if I can help it. Um, but yeah, I, I maintain several lists of resources and a lot of those honestly are links to other resources. Like you guys have got some great resources. Privacy tools.io is a great resource. Privacy guides. Um, I, there are some people doing some amazing work and I don't know how they manage to not only collect this stuff, but review a lot of these things and organize them and put them in tables and charts. And so when I can, I refer people to those. I mean, if you want to see a list of resources, I've, I, I mean, I've also maintained a list. Obviously you guys have got great content. I've referred many people to your guys' site um, so that you're a great resource. Privacytools.io, uh, Privacy Guides. I know there's some history there, but um, they're, they're, they've got some great content. Mozilla has got an interesting uh, thing about products. It's uh, Privacy Not Included that you can check on them. EFF has got some interesting stuff as well. Consumer Reports has got some uh, some great um, resources for privacy that you can trust. For books, I really like Privacy is Power. If you're on the fence about uh, privacy being important and you know, you know, I haven't sold you yet or the Glenn Greenwald thing doesn't sell you, pick up a copy of Privacy is Power and read through that. That's a great book and it's really good about explaining. The person who wrote it, I don't think is a super technical person. So it does, it's not a tech book at all. Um, it's very approachable and, and it really, to me, it's like the Glenn, the Glenn Greenwald thing expanded and improved upon. It's great. So that's a, that, for privacy, that's a great book. Uh, the Art of Invisibility, I've heard so many great things about. It's on my list of things to read. I know it's like, I, it's like watching a trailer for a movie. I kind of know what's there, but I haven't read it yet, but I've heard many great things about The Art of Invisibility. That's on my list. Bruce Schneier's got some really good books. I mean, he originally literally wrote the book on cryptography back in the day. And so that's obviously highly technical. But since then, he's written a lot of great books that are for the average audience. Um, uh, one of the ones I really like is uh, Data and Goliath. D-A-T-A, -A, not David, but Data, Data and Goliath. That's another great book on privacy. There's some other ones that I've heard great things about that honestly are on my list that I need to get to, like Extreme Privacy from uh, Michael Bez Bez Bezel. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Basil. Yeah, Basil, okay. He does OSINT stuff, which is uh, probably well beyond my audience, but it, uh, I would like to read it anyway and probably pull out a few things from that. I think that would be, a, uh, I've heard great things about that book. If cryptography is interesting to you at all, there's, a, there's the code book by Simon Singh, which is, is really cool. It kind of walks through the, the history of cryptography all the way back to Caesar ciphers and some really interesting uh, stuff and kind of walks you through the progression through Enigma and and all the various uh, crypto stuff over the years. I, I personally found that fascinating. And then I've got to recommend a couple uh, like uh, documentaries. There's um, The Social Dilemma, which is, if you're going to pick one, I would really start there because I think what that really brings home is why all this data collection could be weaponized and how it could be weaponized. It's one thing to think, ah, you know, I don't care if Google knows what's on my shopping list. I don't care if, I don't care if they know what I did Saturday night because I don't do anything interesting. When you take all that data together and you put it in the wrong hands, like Cambridge Analytica, that can be weaponized and that affects, I mean, that has had major impacts already on several big democracies, including our own, by the way. Uh, you've got to watch it. So I, I would definitely watch Social Dilemma. 
uh, and the great hack, they actually kind of go together. Actually, I'm probably describing a little bit of both there. Uh, the great hack is another one along those lines. And then there's another one that's kind of hard to find. It's called Terms and Conditions May Apply. Uh, I think you can get to that on Amazon Prime now. Um, it's a little bit hard to find, but it's another really good one about data collection and what you are agreeing to without reading when you click OK and you install these things and run these services. So, um, yeah, those are some of the ones that come to the top of my mind. Very cool. And um, I'm sure we'll link those resources down in the description as well. And the final question I want to leave you with before just like the final few things, what can people who listen to this podcast do to improve the privacy fight? To mean, you know, beyond a lot of the tools and tips and things we've talked about, I think that it's really important to do a couple things. First of all, if you're not the activist type, if you're not the kind of person who's got to go march in the streets for, you know, I want privacy rights or I want GDPR in the U.S. and and go knock on your congressman's door, which, by the way, you can do. I mean, that's their job. They, you can schedule appointments right now with your Congress people. And you should, if you have the capability to do that, bring a couple friends, sit down with them and tell them face to face what you expect them to do for you in Washington. You can also, if you don't have time to do those things, give money to organizations that do. That's the easy button. If uh, there are a lot of great organizations, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the hat you're wearing right now <laughs> is doing some wonderful work and they've been doing that for many years. Uh, ACLU, um, the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, I've got some of these on my website as well. If you search for them, there's a lot of great companies doing really good work, fighting every day for your rights. And if you've, if nothing else, just throw some money at these guys. Um, they uh, Donations go a long way. You don't have to give a lot of money. Uh, you don't have to give regularly if you don't want to, but just just do it. And here's another little thing. When you when you do that, especially like EFF, like when you donate to EFF, a lot of times you can say, you know, send me some stickers, you know, send me some send me some swag. Right. And just like you're doing now, wear, wear it proudly. Put that sticker, put that bumper sticker in your car, wear that shirt, wear the hat. And so that when someone says EFF, what's EFF? Ta -da! You can now have a conversation about EFF, right? And then maybe that leads to other fun conversations about privacy as well. You don't have to, again, a lot of it comes back to the same thing. You don't have to put in tons of effort or tons of money or tons of time to make a big difference. Sometimes supporting other companies that are doing that and other organizations is enough. And if that's all you do, that's still a good thing. And But there are also a lot of things that you can do as an individual, um, contacting your Congress folks, writing them letters, uh, supporting... Uh, candidates that are saying the right things, going to that town hall and asking them those questions. You know, do you support the right to privacy? Is it privacy a human right? What are you going to do about that? These are all things that you can do to further the cause of privacy uh, for all of us. Very cool. I really like that answer. So thank you very much, Carrie. The last thing I'd like to ask is where can people reach you? Okay, so obviously the main property there is firewallsdontstopdragons.com. Uh, if you go there, uh, you'll see the book, you'll see the blog, you'll see the newsletter, you'll get links to the podcast. Uh, all my resources. Uh, so that is that is the one stop shop for all things, uh, all things me. If you go there and you want to dig deep enough, if you want to reach out to me that there's a contact page there, you can find different ways to reach out to me. I'm also on Patreon. I, I've got some really great patrons that are kind of helping me. I'm retired, I don't need I don't make a lot of money, but it's nice to cover my own costs. And, and so I'm kind of at the point now with patrons where uh, I'm covering my own costs. And now I want to kick things up. Now that I'm retired, I want to spend a little money on marketing, I want to spend a little money on revamping my website, and all those things cost money. So uh, it's really nice that you know, some people just kind of support me that way. So you can find me on Patreon as well. So honestly, really, and you can get to all that stuff for the website. So if you want to learn more, go to firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. Perfect. And we'll have it linked down in the description. So everyone go check out the stuff. It's all great stuff, especially the book. I got to read the book. It's really great, especially for people new to the world. And it's something that great to give to a friend or a family member who's never been exposed to this stuff before. With all that said, I really want to thank you for your time, Perry. It's been an honor. I'm glad we finally got you on here. And uh, I have nothing but great things to say about what you're doing. So thank you so much for putting up a great fight and for giving people such a great entryway into the world of privacy. Well, dude, thanks for what you guys are doing, too. I know this sounds like a mutual admiration society, but you guys are doing great work, too. And I, I, I love the videos. I've, I've wanted to get into making some of those kind of videos for a long time. And now it's like, I don't need to. You guys do it. So, so I just point people to you. You guys are doing great stuff. Well, if you ever have recommendations or anything or things you want us to make, just shoot over a message and we'll do it. Yep, so. absolutely. Thanks, man. Good to see yeah. you. One final thing, if you made it to the end of this interview, Carrie has a Patreon and he's running a special event for patrons right now for one of these really cool dragon coins. Aside from honestly just being cool, they allow you to generate secure passphrases and the Patreon also comes with several other cool perks like a book club. He only has so many coins to give out, so definitely hop on that ASAP if you want a coin. The event ends on June 17th or his Patreon is always open.